There we go. And now I'm going to show my screen. And all right, thank you very much for going and joining joining me once again, guys, for another exciting episode of Ivind. Really, the the mystery's culminating. Today we're going to find out who uh, who killed Colonel Mustard in the billiard room. So we'll uh, after that we tackle uh, life, the universe, and everything. But beyond that, uh, looking at the actual uh, at what we're actually covering today is. Um, these are various Ivan features. Now, these are some of the things that I haven't actually really dived into uh, much as we go along because, um, and I love the way that it's got multiple subsidiaries twice, we're only going to do it once. Um, but this is uh, bits and pieces that you guys do need to go and ha that we do need to have a look at. I know we have done Receipt Designer, but there are a couple of other things that are very important that you guys do need to know that Ivan does. As well as uh, what I might also do a bit later, depending on how he goes, I might also go write one of the exams in front of you. And you can go see, um, so you guys might uh, get a glimpse into some of the questions that you might get. <clears throat> but that all depends on how we go for time. So, um, yeah, so if you do know anyone else who is going to attend, tell them to attend because they might get a, they might get a glimpse of some of the questions out there but on that note let's move forward okay so first first thing up that I really want to have a look at is locations now I mentioned locations before I didn't have them set up previously in the system but I have set them up in the system now um, we go along to enterprise and it's enable locations. It's there. Once it's enabled, it's a, once again, it's one of these yes, no kind of things. It's either there or it's not there. Once it's there, it's there. Congratulations, you have locations. Right. Okay. But even having it there, it, it just means that you've enabled the functionality. It doesn't actually fundamentally change anything in the system. In order to go change things in the system, you actually need to come to uh, retail config. Uh, you go to warehouse, and in the actual warehouse itself, I'm choosing the avenues, you will go and see that it says enable locations over here. Once these locations are enabled here, then it will go and ask to go add in additional locations. Now, that's something that's quite important. And just to, and just to explain what locations are, um, when you walk into a supermarket right you'll normally find that each supermarkets divided into different sections typically um, or at least this seems to be the way of most supermarkets no matter where I go you end up with a uh, fresh fruit and veg uh, meat a butchery type section uh, bakery uh, liquor section um, you know and then there's various other things uh, cold meats deli uh, canned goods, all the rest of it, um, pet, uh, the pet aisle, you know, the different aisles that you get when you wander into a, uh, when you wander into a store. Now, with that, there are some items that only go to some places in the store. Okay, so for instance, um, fresh fruit and veg only goes to the fresh fruit and veg section. You're not expecting that to go see, to go see fresh fruit and veg and say the tinned goods section. It doesn't make sense. But and what you can do over here is you can go create the, these locations and you can also say what you can do from each of these locations. And that's where it becomes quite important. Um, because as well as a fresh fruit and veg section, butchery, bakery, all the rest of it, you can also end up with a refund location. Now a refund location is the location where you store all the goods that are uh, uh, that have been damaged for whatever reason. Uh, nine times out of ten, it, uh, this is the stuff that people bring back and they go say, "Oh no, my shirt is uh, my shirt's got a problem," or uh, "Or there's a rip in my shirt that was there when I bought it. Can I please get my money back?" Sure, no problem. Or I've just opened up and I turned on the cell phone and it's, uh, it doesn't turn on. There's an issue with the cell phone. Um, and that's what you need. You do need a separate location for it because some, uh, some of these guys, they, get, they go and say, oh, well, we've got 10 of these on stock. Okay, must sell 10. Actually, no, you don't have 10 of them in stock. You've got eight. Two of them are actually, uh, two of them are actually in for repair. 
Um, and as well, you can also go, and please remember, these over here are just the, uh, these are just the, the generic default locations that get associated with the warehouse. These aren't all the locations you can have for a warehouse. You can actually have more locations. And in order to show you that, I'm going to come here to the actual location setup. You'll see I've got a batch of them over here. And I'm going to go open up one. And you'll see a location is assigned to a warehouse over here. What this does mean is that you can have multiple locations that do multiple things. You can even have a location that's frozen. So for instance, if there is a display location, um, and this is this does sometimes happen, there is a certain item that will only be for display purpose, it, it will be marked for display purposes only. Um, typically, these are items that are, for whatever reason, are, uh, specifically set up that way for display. Um, they're not meant to be sold, they're not meant to be used, they're just display, uh, display paraphernalia. Um, and so what you can actually do is you can have a location where none of these things is ticked. You know, or, and none of these, uh, none of what you can do over here in this location is ticked at all. Which does mean that you then have a location that's essentially frozen. So that is something else to consider. Please remember there are a lot of these, um, and you can set them up how you want. Um, the other thing to consider is that as well with the point of sale, uh, oh, in, this one, in this version I don't have it, in the next version 654, which is available, in fact 655 is out, you are actually able to assign a point of sale to a location. And that's quite important because I do know, and it's the one thing that we didn't counter a lot with, um, particularly with uh, a lot of the uh, a lot of these uh, countries where you have uh, tuk-tuks and people going out and selling things and farmers markets, um, and particularly these places where they've got uh, trucks and they sell from the back of a truck. Um, you can actually go and assign stock to a location that's tied to a point of sale. That means that that's tied to that truck which means that you can actually go and keep track of what sales are, ha are happening from a mobile point of sale to that truck uh, that's, uh, that's actually going around. So you've got things that are covered the entire way. All right. Okay. Any questions? None. Okay. All right. Well, if you guys, if you guys know what I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about. So just be aware. You can get that set up over there. Uh, something I do want to point out in the warehouse setup is that if I come here to general warehouse, you'll see uh, locations aren't enabled. If, if locations aren't enabled here, then they're not, they, it doesn't use locations at all. If, if they are enabled, then you do need to, then it will go and ask you what locations do you want. So. All right, so that one went down quickly. Next one up, uh, I'm going to come back to multiple subsidiaries because I do need to turn something on for that, but authorizations is the next thing we're looking for. Um, the authorizations, here we go, oh, wait, there you go. authorizations, yes. Um, what we've got over here is the, uh, first off, before I even get to these authorizations here, the first set of authorizations you really actually have are over here in the retail profile. I open this up, I scroll down, we go to manager override required. This is really the first set of authorizations you get. Okay, so these are void sale, delete a delete item, delete this, change this, modify, protect, all the rest of it. Um, there you go, you can go see those. Delete suspended transactions, yes, no, do you have rights for that or not? And do you require management override for it? So this is the first real set of authorizations I've got here. The other one I have is I can then activate what is called advanced authorizations. Ooh, uh, now, advanced authorizations, there, there it is. Okay, in this case it's activated. Once again, it is a checkbox. You turn it on and it's enabled. Okay, right there, you can't really turn it off again. Okay, even if I turned it off, it's not going to go and let me go through. So, author advanced authorization, it's there. Now, once it's activated, you then get to come along to authorization over here. You then get to go and set up your authorization templates and authorization stages. Uh, 
Now, you SAP Business One guys out there are going to go say, hey, this looks very familiar, because yes, this is it was based off that. And you do have to remember that you need to go edit to go and get this open. So what we have over here is this is an authorization template. Uh, you've got your ID, your description, and whether do you require comments or not for authorization, and what exactly are those comments are. Then we've got the originators. Now your originator over here is who triggers the authorization. Is it the cashier? Is it the, at the moment this is number four, so user four, that's the in, a, in an administrator role, who triggers the authorization. Uh, then what stage does it go through? So if you trigger the authorization, so these people trigger it, then how do you deal with the authorization? Okay, and for that you're going to set up different authorization stages. And you can have multiple stages here. You can have as many stages as you want. So you can have multiple level authorizations. But the next, uh, but just before I go and switch across, yes, there is another tab up here. I do know what, do know it's there. I'm going to come back to it. Before I do switch across that, I just want to come to the authorization stage so we can go see exactly what that is. Now the authorization stage is if I go edit, these are the approvers. Okay, who is required to approve this? That's the real question. So you can go and uh, you can go set uh, who, uh, who can approve it, how many, what the number of approvals are, how many people need to approve it before it can go forward. That is set over here. So essentially, if we have a look back here, these are the people who trigger it, these are the people and the number of authorizations that are required to approve it. Once again, multiple levels can be had over here, so you can go and have, you might have somebody trigger it, and then it can go from stage to stage to stage to stage, depending on what you want. But then, beyond that, what do you trigger it on? And that's where we come to the authorization condition setup. And if you've got sharp eyes, you will have noticed that these conditions over here are exactly the same as the conditions that were in the retail profile that I wouldn't have showed you over here. That is correct. The ones that are in the retail profile are exactly the same as the ones over here. That is normal. Okay. Now, what this essentially means is that if I do, in this particular case, if I do a cash in or cash out, it will then go trigger the, uh, it will then trigger the approval. So if I come along to my point of sale, let's expand it, make it a bit bigger. There we go. I go to my little iVend user menu, I come across to, let's go cash out, and you'll see it brings up this screen, okay, which is now my approve reject uh, information. So I can then sign in using my username and password, and comment, whatever it might be. All right, you can then approve or reject it. And then you go log in, and if I've got my password right, then it should go through. And then in this particular case, it's asking for three, which I hope I've got the password for this one. And, yeah, no, it doesn't want to go. And, oh, comment not provided, so. Right, please note, we do not go, and uh, spelling doesn't count over here. And then I can do a cash out of, let's do $10. And then, once again, I can again enforce a comment in a reason code. And guys, I, I'm gonna, yeah, there we go. So tipple point reach. Normally you'd have more reason codes over here. I would, in fact, I recommend having more reason codes here. Don't just have one reason code. Otherwise it all just goes and falls under one, one particular pile. Um, Sage guys, uh, please note once again that your reason codes are actually linked to your expense accounts that are used for cash in and cash out or for your payments. So that's something else to go and consider. You do need to go have that there. I click OK, and it's done. Ta-da! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, crowd goes wild. Moving on. Okay, but that's the very important thing you get over there is multiple levels. Um, you can go and enforce who does what. Uh, you can go and enforce comments. You can enforce who, uh, uh, what happens here. And if I remember correctly, there is a question on this. And it's a question I haven't had anybody ask me yet, so I'm going to go ask it, and I will tell you what the answer is. And the way it works, gentlemen, 
ladies and gentlemen, is, right, which if I've got something ticked over here, let's say over here I come along to my management override required and I have the, and you see over here I've got cash in and cash out ticked, but I've also got my, uh, but if I come over here, you'll see that on my authorization template, my edit, I go over here, I've also got it ticked here. The question is which one wins out? So if I've got them both ticked, which one will the system use? And obviously, as you, quite, as you saw now, the system will use the authorization template. It won't use the one, it will, once it's authorized here, it will assume the one in the retail profile is authorized. And I do have a question. Ooh. It's okay, Vanessa, I forgive you. All right, so long as you wait and you manage to get your, your demo stack installed and working, then it's fine. Okay, all right, but the, that's the important thing to note, uh, to note over here is, uh, Oh dear. Okay, we'll have a session a bit later, Vanessa, and see what we can sort out. Okay, but that's the important thing to note: is, ca is uh, your authorization template over here will override the um, will override the one that is in the retail profile. And just to give you an idea what the retail profile one looks like, is let's just load up an item. Okay, I then go suspend recall. Yes, I want to suspend the transaction, and I saw, I saw earlier this is uh, set to go and do this. So, it requires management override. Do you want to continue? Yes, and then it will open up this screen. Um, if it's got biometrics, you can use biometrics to log in, and you can go and set it here. So, uh, so if you've got biometrics, you just put your fingerprint here, and it will log in. Okay. All right, so there, ta-da, sales being suspended. Right, moving swiftly forward, very swiftly forward. Okay, I'm going to come back to POS Designer. I just want to do notifications, and then I'll do some of the fail-safe offline and POS Designer. We can have a look at it. Uh, I want to do notifications and audit logs. Um, try and get the small things out of the way quickly. Okay, so notifications. Or you can also go and set up your system to go and put alert notifications out, uh, up here. So, for instance, if there's a price change, right, who does it alert? Does it do an application alert? Um, right, code description type. Uh, and you'll see there's actually a drop-down list over here that you have. So, you can put it as, and the first one that actually pops up is query. Okay, which is uh, which is really one of the ones you need to look at. Um, oh, that is one thing I do want to point out about uh, before I jump onto this. That is one thing I do want to point out about the authorization template is there is no place to put a query in here. Right there, these are the conditions. That's it. There's no query that goes with it that you can use to trigger it off another subset of conditions. So just please be aware of that. This is it is what it is. You you can't you can't really change it short of extensibility. Okay, but the alert notification setup over here, you can uh, you can then go set. Um, do you want to add all users automatically? Is there an email or SMS template that goes with it? And what is the query if you're using a query that's associated with it over here? So you see priceless change. Uh, bonus bar creation or goods receipt issue, goods receipt certification, all the rest of it that is available over here and you can use that. <clears throat> all right, so that's the notification setup um, that is set over, uh, over here. Once it's set up, you can actually set up the notif you can get the alert notification view, which will appear over here if there are any unread ones or read ones or here we go. You see, when the purchase order was created, it gives me a notification on what the purchase order was. Okay. So those are all created over here and can be set up for exactly how I want to go and view them. Okay. And you can also email these. Please remember that. Um, also, the users that you put here. Okay. Well, I've got all users set up. But um, if they're associated with a store, they'll also be... Uh, alerted for that user at that store. 
Okay, alert notifications then. The next one I wanted to have a look at was my audit logs. Okay, and we do ask you about audit logs, guys. We do ask you about alert notifications. And the audit logs over here are very important if you are familiar with them. Okay, the first thing up that we've got is the audit log master, which is basically asking which logs do you want, uh, where do you want logging enabled. Okay, so these are the different areas we actually keep track of. Um, please remember, you can't really go back and modify something like a sale after you've done it. A sale's a sale. There's no modification that goes with it. Um, you can do a credit note and recreate it, but you can't really go to a sale and say, uh, change the remarks. Doesn't happen, right there. Ivan, uh, Ivan doesn't allow you to do that. It will allow you to recall it and to view it, but not really change it. So that's one of the things you won't really see the sales transactions over here. You might see the, um, uh, you will actually go see things like purchase orders and uh, those sort of things, because those you can go back and modify, but um, and or at least in later later versions you see it, but in uh, in this version over here, um, no, they uh, the transactions are transaction. Once it's loaded, that's it. Um, over here we can uh, so you can see the various things, but it covers most things that you, that you will actually look for: departments, employees, any changes at the enterprise, uh, any changes on the products. On your product master, it'll detect, and but that's what you're looking at. If you have a look over here at, at audit log, you can then select your source type, and as we scroll down, we eventually get to. I'm going to go product master because more than likely stuff has been changed, and then I'll be able to search for it. Okay, it's just thinking. There we go. So you see over here, it's now listed all of the changes that have taken place. Um, It'll start off, uh, it's listed who did it, what did it, time, date, where it happened, all the rest of it, as well as what the thing was before, as well after. All of it is set here. Let me see, has it finished thinking? Nope, still thinking. Okay, all right, so that is, maybe I shouldn't have chosen Product Master. It's got a bit much on it. But this is all here. It is listed. It does cover it. And you can go see exactly what is displayed or is not displayed. You can see what what things were. You can go see um, what they are now, and you can go see exactly, uh, you can go and, well, yeah, it covers everything that you've got over here. So that just really helps go get everything there. Please remember, you do have your things up here. You can also right-click group by columns. Uh, so, for instance, if I've got, uh, here we go, let's group by record ID. So over there, you can go see updates and changes that have gone and happened through there. You see, it, it is actually, uh, these group by, these right-click things are actually generally helpful. Um, and you can go see what things uh, were, how they changed, if things changed. Uh, you see right there, there, the, it changed from true to false, or well, false to true, there. Let me just check. Yeah, you see somebody added an image to, to it. Okay, so that is all available over here in the audit log. Obviously, the entire thing is, guys, is that you do, after a while, you are going to need to go clear out your audit log for a certain amount um, because it does get quite, um, uh, it can go just end up overwhelming your database, if it, particularly on some of your older setups. Um, then, okay, so that's audit logs. Then, next step is POS Designer. All right. Now, POS customization and POS designing is something that we've there, that we have brought in. There are videos on this, guys. Um, okay. Uh, before I even get into POS designer, guys, there is I believe there is a question on uh, on the audit report. So just make sure you know that. Um, yeah. Once again, but once again, have Ivend open, and then you'll be able to go and get it. Uh, sorted and set up. Okay, but first off, pause customization is uh, something we're going to have a look at. Now, layouts. We come with a batch of layouts by default. You are going to have these layouts set up in your system. Um, these ones are ones that are, um, uh, these ones come with the system itself. You can modify them any way you want. Um, in fact, I'm just, 
just give me a second over here. What I'm going to do is open and I will just show you what some of the different ones look like because otherwise I need to load them up individually and it can take a bit of time. So you can go see exactly what they look like. Yes, you can even put it as bright blue if you really want to, but uh, that's all available. That is set up over here. And you've got, there is actually one other template, which is a standard IVN template, which you will remember I was using last week. Okay, this one is rather limited in what it can do. Um, this one is very locked down. Um, it's the one, it's the reason we don't really go and suggest people go and use this, um, primarily because, uh, well, things, people need to change things. And um, with this, it's not very easy to actually modify. However, if you go to something like the apparel template, which to be very honest, I think looks better, um, you can then start to go and modify things and change exactly how things look. Um, uh, let me go and, uh, okay, so something, uh, something that you do need to note over here is that each of these button panels Okay, and you'll see over here on the actual on the actual load up here, it actually gives you diff five different button panels you can get. You all this is all these are are the five panels on the actual screen itself. Okay, so this is a button panel. This is a button panel. This is a button panel. Uh, if I remember correctly, you can have sub button panels. Okay, and by sub button uh, panels, I mean, for instance, uh, like over here, I click on each of these and it opens up. You see the this one is slightly different in size and shape. That's a, that's a different button panel to this button panel. So you can actually, uh, even though it limits you to five uh, up front, um, you can actually have more underneath and more and more and more. Really, you can go quite deep with these. Um, but to really go, uh, to really go get a start with this, Let's just go and uh, I'm just going to go, I'm going to focus on the button panels and then I'll show you how to move things around. First thing I want to do is, if I'm going to have a look at the button panels, is that I need to right click on it. You'll see it opens up uh, design panel edit, uh, button edit and button size. Now button size just tells me what the size is. It's straightforward. Right click, uh, button edit. That will actually edit that specific button as to what it actually does. Right. But the real one you go is right click design panel edit. This over here actually designs what the panel is, how it fits together. So you've got say, you see over here it's got five columns, it's got two rows, it's got a margin around it, uh, if there's a specific style that's associated with it. Um, and you can set up your own button styles over here. What's the background color that's associated with it? Uh, once you've set that up, you can go apply changes and it will go set up, draw the lines through here. You can also go well, you also preview and it gives you a basic idea of what it looks like. Please be aware that yes, this is a basic idea and even though it does have sort of a click functionality, it is not actually what it looks like. Okay, if I go and I cancel this, you'll see that this is now stretched it to go fit into this area. And guys, when you are designing the button panel, please be aware of this because this is something that does drive some people a bit dippy, is um, I... Now, I, I know most of you guys out there, you're running your your laptop screens at, you know, uh, 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 one, uh, was it 108, uh, 108 um, or 1920 uh, by 108 or something like that. Most modern laptop screens are actually particularly high res. They can handle it. That's what they do. It's a... That's how uh, that's how things fit together with these things. But the problem is, guys, is that um, a lot of the times your point of sales do not actually go and handle that size screen. If you have a look at our point of sale over here, I mean, I know I've expanded it, but this over here is this screen size over here is one hundred two four by seven six eight. Most POS screens work along something of a similar size. POS screens today do not, well, uh, there are uh, exceptions, but most POS screens do not go up to that higher, uh, do not go and ex uh, do not go up to that higher resolution. And even if they do, sometimes they are scaled back because um, with the POS screen itself, it does actually mean that, um, uh, 
you know, sometimes these, uh, to be very honest, some of these, uh, some of these cashiers are looking at the screen through Coke bottle lenses. They need all the help. They need the nice big buttons to go press because otherwise um, they can't see what they're doing. So when you're setting up your pause, when you're setting up the pause screen here, please remember it is going to stretch it and reshape it when you go and you load it into here for the actual point of sale. And I'm actually going to show you that in a second because um, the pause screen, uh, let me actually go and show, show that to you now. So you've got the pause screen over here. And I'm sure the next question you're all asking me is, but Keith, how do you link the pause screen to actually what's displaying? There's a couple of areas. The first area we're going to have a look at is the retail config. If I go to retail profile, uh, I open up my default profile. And you see it's my default profile is set to I've, is set to I've in template. Okay, that's one way to go and set. Uh, there's the pause layout. There's the ones we've been talking about. I'm going to set it to apparel template because that's the one I want. I click OK. And yes, I know it's got, it says that, but that's fine. But even now that I've set it there, we can all see that the apparel template is not the one that's being used here. So even if I refresh it, it's not going to bring this in. So what I need to do is I now need to check, in this particular case, uh, is it what's attached to the employee? Because remember, the retail profile goes and appears everywhere, and we see on my employee that the retail profile is the sports profile. I am going to go and change that to the default profile. Click OK. OK, and I'm going to go over here. And I might need to restart my pause for this. I go Restore Layout. I click OK, and it's changed to the apparel store. And this is exactly, and it's displaying exactly what I mean, uh, what I was saying earlier with, if you're going to have a look at my iVent template, no, not my iVent template, sorry, wrong one, my apparel template, you can clearly see how it's gone and shrunk and maneuvered things around so that they don't appear correct, so they don't look correctly over here. Guys, this is something that you have to deal with on a case-by-case -case basis. This is also part of the reason that we normally suggest that all pause go, uh, that your pause all confine themselves to a fairly normal layout, because, um, or a fairly normal hardware type, because if you've got some pro line pause and you've got some, uh, I don't know, uh, cubed and some IBM and some Siemens Nextdorf and you know any one of these positive things they do react their screens do react slightly differently it does complicate things over here but having said that that is something that you just need or if you go and you set it to more or less the same screen size you should be fine it does mean that once you've set it over here and that's part of the reason that we put this button here is you should go and you change the layout you save it you restore the layout. Once you've restored the layout, you can then see, does it actually work or not? So for the actual, uh, I've shown you how to customize the button panel there, but I can also go and open up the customization view here. And this actually goes and contains uh, much of the customization of the overall setup here. Um, Guys, in case you're wondering, you're not going to be asked so much on the POS designer. Okay, you're going to be asked some basic things about it. You might be asked how many button panels you can load with it, in which case the answer is five. But to be very honest, you're not going to be asked so much about the, um, uh, you're not going to be asked sort of, oh, where does this go, where does the, you know, can you load this over here? That kind of stuff, no. Um, there are certain hidden items over here that you can go add in. So, for instance, if I wanted to go add in, uh, right, an additional button panel, I can put that in over there. You see, in a simple drag and drop stuff, you know. And what's also very handy is if I go controls, uh, is uh, if I don't want to go keep it like that, I can just close that, cancel. And once again, remember guys, saving is important. If in doubt, save. Um, if you want to go, but I'm just going to come back and just dive into the button, into the design panel edit over here. And once you've gone, you've created your buttons and how you want it, you can come over here to your individual captions, 
you can then double click on the line and it will take you through to the actual customize button setup. On the customize button setup, you can set things like your transparency, um, caption is operation, which basically means that if, I, if you tick that, it's going to be, it'll say product search for the caption. Is it visible or not? You can have invisible buttons, right? For whatever reason, you might want it uh, to go say hide the manager override button, for instance. Uh, is there a shortcut key associated with it? So is, uh, for instance, your F keys, so for instance, F2. And then you can go set that there. And um, most importantly, particularly for you guys with multiple languages in your country, you can also set the globalization. So what does it say in one language? What does it say in which language? So for instance, French and English. Finally, you've also got the, what does the operation do? Yes. Yes, doctor, the patient requires an operation. No, not that sort of operation. So what exactly does it do? And there are a number of these over here that are very important. And these carry, these are things like cash and cash out. Basically, all most of your pulse events can be actually captured there. But if we go further down, uh, there's, for instance, things like uh, item edit, sale, li uh, lock pause, uh, do you want to log out the pause, manage tools, new scan. There is a button that says no operation and that is quite deliberate because um, with that you do not, wa uh, it's basically uh, a button that you can have that you can then attach a bit of uh, accessibility to. So this button will then open up say a separate screen. All right, you don't actually, you want it to be a button but you don't want it to do anything in iVent, you just wanted to do something in, uh, you just wanted to do something in your program as opposed to your extensibility. Um, there's also open menus, and if, you, if I select something like open menu, this over here is where I can link a menu, uh, one menu, one button panel to a second button panel, to a second uh, to a second button grid. So I can go down on this quite far. Uh, I can also go say uh, if I want to do things like well I had this one as product search that's there and you'll see that as I go and I select some of these things it does go bring up additional um, additional attributes additional uh, things in here that we can go and uh, that you can go add in now let me see there is one over here I did want to go and have a look at so transaction search and it's <laughs> and of course I've come to the end and I've not found the one that I'm looking for. Um, if I remember correctly, it should be item, Is it item sale, yeah, here you go. So if you want to assign a specific item to go sell something uh, to this specific button, you can do that as well. You can assign, uh, I think it's customers, I think there's a customer sale one as well, or custom event, uh, you got customer search, customer view. All of these are available over here. Please remember, guys, the entire thing about this is it's there to be designed, to be played with, to be... Uh, it's a bit like report designing, to be honest. Um, I mean, there's some vi there's some wonderful videos online of people just going and whipping up a quick pause setup. Um, yeah, right, no. Uh, yeah, that's something that I would say, guys, more happens... On, it, it happens in videos. It doesn't happen over here in... Um, it doesn't really happen so much in real life. As you know, with writing reports, it's very easy to do a scripted video. Um, but if you're writing a report, you change this, you change that, you and what, uh, you change a bit, and you also go just see how things work. Um, and then you save, 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 if in doubt, save. All right. Uh, margin headers, overrides. The style button over here, um, this is if you want to go and set a specific, if you want to create a specific style for the button. Um, you can do that. You can also go say, I want a custom style. In which case, you can then go and have, in which case, you can then change things like the font, the bold, you know, is it bold, italic, underline, strike through. What's the color? Uh, there you go. So your colors, and once again, you've got all that, and you've got more colors, and you can select exactly what shade of octarine you want. Um, so you can go put that there, you know, tangerine or taupe or whatever it is. You can put that. You can put that in. The other one is um, you can load up images on here. Uh, the images I think are, uh, if I remember correctly, they're PNG or JPEG or bitmap. There you go. So PNG, JPEG or bitmap. 
All right. And image location, uh, where do you want it? Middle left, top right, top bottom, all the rest to it. You can go and get it and adjust it there. At the end of which, it will then go and give you a sample. Yeah, if I untick that, it goes and it hides all of these because it, uh, it gives it from the same basic button style. It'll give you a sample of what it looks like, and you can even go, you can even click it a couple of times to see what it does, which is absolutely nothing because it's just a style. Once you've done that, and you can go through and you can set that for each of these. Obviously, guys, to be very honest, um, what I am more expecting you to do is um, you're probably going to take one of these. In fact, what I find most people do is they will go, look at, they will go find the uh, the layout that more or less matches what the customer wants um, then modify it a little bit so it looks about right and then go from there um, I've very 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 few people I know have created one from scratch primarily because creating it from from scratch can be a bit of a uh, can be a bit of a pain um, let me actually just show you what you get to start with when you create it from scratch which is if I go new um, I'm just going to call this one as test. Okay. By the way, there is an option to set it as default if you want. I then go pause designer, and that's the default one. It's uh, yeah, as you can see over here, there's the search, uh, there's the search bar, customer information, line item information, discounts and totals, and what's up here. Uh, and you can hide uh, once again hiding columns. You can. Uh, Go customize layout. Go change exactly what fits into here. It's there. I, I expect you to know it's there. I also expect you to. Uh, I'm also not expecting you to go know precisely how to go change the corner to be rounded on a button, as opposed to going and being, um, as opposed to uh, you know how you go and you uh, adjust the curve and the edges and all the rest of it. That's not something I'm expecting, guys. Really, to be very honest. Um, these things are uh, these things are once again things you play with and things you figure out as you go along. Yes, I have a question. Uh, yes, Willem, uh, UDFs can be loaded onto the grid. Uh, in fact, if I go along here to the apparel templates, was designer. Uh, I do actually. I think I've got some UDFs that are actually associated with. There you go. CXS trend. So there, I can go load that on, that one on. Oh, hang on, wait. There. So yeah, uh, yeah, guys. That's one thing about UDFs. They all start with U. So and to show you where that actual one is, if I go to customer, yeah, and this is the advantage of the demo stack is I can open them up, and we already have. Some user defined fields in here. So there's the UDF. There's the associated UDF I put into there. But from here, I can also start to do things like uh, change caption. So I don't want that. I just want that to be um, trained. That's all available there. Um, and if I went OK, OK. And then I go over here, I go to there, I go restore layout, everything explodes. What? <laughs> no, it didn't explode. For once! <laughs> Woohoo! Right there. Success is mine! Right. Okay, so there we go. Trend. Casual. Ta-da! Okay, guys. So that's just a basic idea of what it is. Um, and uh, one other thing I do want to point out about the about this over here is um, one, the demo stack has got better pictures loaded with it. Uh, this is to include UDFs on line levels. Ah, excellent question. Okay, uh, normally no. Um, that's because we've got a separate way to activate UDFs, which I'm going, which is one of the next things I'm going to show you, which is sales and which is sales and line item attributes. Okay. Oh, uh, guys, just give me a second. I'm just going to get. I just need to get a glass of water, and I'll be right back. Right back. So, okay, UDFs on the lines, because this is obviously the next thing that is going to be very interesting to everyone. Um, is Obviously, we can do it. So let's go up, and I will just show you where you can go add those in. Now, I've mentioned earlier 
that you can get you can go add these in you I think I mentioned it with the other set of UDFs that you can go and get them uh, you can get them set up and what we've got over here is what we call sales attributes and transaction item attributes now sales attributes these would be user defined fields for the actual uh, for the actual uh, sale itself so let's go up here and create new one and I'm gonna call this one age okay a sequence which is where do you uh, if you've got multiple of these so which one do you where do you want it to appear where do you want uh, where do you want to do the capture at the beginning or the end of the sale is it a mandatory field or not uh, does it have uh, and here's where we start getting into interesting things so validation type is it against a table so against a UDT user defined table in the system or is it valid values I'm gonna go valid values for this one so does it have a default value uh, is there a regex pattern associated with it yes you can actually load that one in uh, what is the table name um, the regex pattern is available if I have got none because then it's an actual it's just something I type in uh, table name if I've selected table then it will go table name done values is it integrated and is it what is the integrated field name okay guys uh, SAP business one guys pay attention right because this is where it will actually go say it's integrated tick and then it goes against a SAP business one uh, user defined field if it's a sale attribute, it goes against the sales attributes on the transaction documents. So it'll go on the ones, for instance, you'll quote sales order and invoice. Uh, for you other guys doing Sage and all the rest of that, uh, it does depend on what t on what system you're using. Um, yeah, that's uh, uh, as I do understand, it is coming to X3 or 300, but not so much Sage One. So obviously, Sage One doesn't have the capability for this. So uh, that is something else to go. Uh, that is something else to consider. Uh, for nav guys, I do think this does synchronize, but it's some. Um, I I, stay, I, I, that, I take that under correction. So you can also make it. Is it active or not? And where is it applicable? Okay, sales, sales refund, exchange. Or do you want all of them? Some of them? Whatever you want over there. Uh, add values. Well, valid values. You can put that here. So for instance, if I want to go say. Uh, Let's go 18, and I'll put that one as 18 to 25. <sighs> that doesn't help. Add value, and I'm going to go, say, 26 to 30. Well, it's 26 to 30, and you can go on with your different values like that. Otherwise, like I said, uh, if I just, yes, I do want to delete the select record, and I'm going to delete that value, yes. Otherwise, I'm just going to go over here with none, so I can just type it in. I click OK. All right. I know it says no records found, but the reason is if I go shift it to end of sale. I go search. It goes and it finds it there. Uh, and unfortunately, in order to actually go trigger that, um, I don't think that will come through now unless I go collect attributes. Yeah, you see it hasn't loaded the attributes here. So I'm going to just need to restart my point of sale. Sometimes it's just easier to go and complete the sale than to actually go and uh, do the uh, manager override. There we go. Fire up the pause. Uh, here we go, let's log in. Okay, here we go. And that's now loaded up, so let's do a sale. There we go, you see, I told you they're much better pictures here. Um, and please remember as well, once this thing resizes, it does also change where the picture sits. So, 
Next one up is, what are we looking at over here? Okay, so if I want to access the, now I haven't set it as a required sales attribute. Um, so I go sales edit, I can then go collect attributes and you'll see over there it's got age. I can set this that it is required so it will auto open the sales attribute when I go to the end of the sale. I don't think I've got, yeah, there we go. So there I went age and it automatically opened. I haven't set this as mandatory, uh, uh, so I should just be able to go okay and it will allow me through. If it's not mandatory, uh, well, it will, if it is mandatory, I would be, uh, it would force me to go and enter in a value. Completed. Da -da. Okay, that's sales attributes, but we have much the same thing, and if you don't mind, I'm actually just going to go and turn that off because otherwise it's going to drive me nuts. Okay, which is precisely what it's meant to do to the cashiers so that they do actually fill it in. I'm going to go and uh, I will show you also how it works over here. The transaction item attribute works precisely the same way. Okay, the only difference is, is that instead of it being over here on, instead of it being as part of the header information, it is actually loaded on the, uh, let me go item edit, it is actually loaded uh, over here on your item sale information. So that is something that is a bit different but it's essentially being loaded on the item line as opposed to being loaded on the um, as opposed to being loaded on the header information so that is also there sets up exactly the same way I, so I'm not actually going to create one if you guys want to create one in your spare time you can do it you can have that look through once again same thing can integrate through is it integrated and what's the integrated field name so all right so those are the item attributes. Uh, then let me just quickly go and have one last look over here. Okay, all right, so we've done the POS designer. We've done locations, done authorizations, done, 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 done. Okay, all right, offline terminal POS and fail-safe POS. Okay, these ones are a bit, I kind of have to talk around these ones a bit because I can't really activate them on my system for obvious reasons. Um, First off, uh, the offline pause, well, I would need to be offline for that to work. But let me talk around it so you at least understand the concept about what's going on. Now, with the whole cloud thing coming up, the obviously the normal sort of cloud deployment landscape that we'd look at would be something like this. Okay, this is a slightly old slide. It's not exactly how it is anymore. Because what's also happened is now people have been asking, can they move the store server to the cloud? Which means basically you have a POS that's connected directly to the cloud. Now, this does obviously pose some issues, particularly when you have a, um, uh, particularly when the internet goes down. Because if the internet goes down and there's no local store server, then there's no connection to the pause, which means there's no information going to the pause, which means that you're stuffed. At least that would have been if we hadn't gone and set this up. Now, I'm going to show you where you enable this, and I'll explain to you exactly what it does as we go along. You go and you enable this, uh, if I remember correctly, over here at the store. Okay, this is the first point. You actually enable that, enable offline store. Um, and what this does is it forces the installation of SQL Express over here at the point of sale. SQL Express, uh, once again, it's like a store server light gets installed at, this, at the point of sale, which means that if you go and, um, uh, if for instance, you go and uh, you do go lose internet, you do still have the local in information that's still stored on here, so it can go resynchronize back across from the store server in the cloud. Um, yeah, guys, um, in fact, just to go and make it a bit clearer what I'm talking about, I'm just going to go and uh, let's just go delete that store server. There. So, You've now got that going going across there, but once again, your 
once again, because you've got that SQL Express going and sitting over here at the I've in pause, it does mean that um, it, it does mean that yeah, you can carry on processing. There are some limitations with regarding to that. For instance, uh, it wouldn't normally. Uh, for instance, because it can't, it definitely can't connect to the internet. Um, it normally doesn't allow things like credit card transactions or store credit transactions. Anything that would require validation from the cloud uh, or from things on the internet would normally stop. So because obviously a credit card can't be validated because it, you can't contact the credit card server, no credit cards. So no internet, no credit cards. However, you can still carry on processing on things like, for instance, loyalty card, well, uh, loyalty coupons, gift certificates, things like that, because it will obviously have that information stored with it. Um, there are some, once again, it's set up in such a way that you can carry on. It's it, really it's 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 more that you ha uh, it's more designed that you have your store server in the cloud. If you've got your store server on premise. I wouldn't worry about activating it. It's not something that you'd really need. Um, how can I put it? It's a bit, uh, as uh, as they say, belts and braces. Uh, you know, really, how much, how worried are you about your pants falling down? Um, you don't, you, under normal circumstances, with a store server over here on uh, on the actual LAN itself, you should be fine. And if you are worried about your store server going down, rather just put in a fail safe. Or um, a fail-safe backup uh, where you can go mirror your transactions to or, or for your actual server. That's actually got, probably going to be quicker and cheaper than going and setting up everything for the POS, for offline POS. Um, the thing to uh, one other thing to note about offline POS is the specs for it are higher. In fact, yeah, let me go across here to CXS. Okay. And that's one thing to note is that for your offline point of sale client, uh, yeah, you do actually require four gigs of RAM. Okay, so it is slightly higher, but uh, it's not. Uh, it, it is enough that particularly you know if you're buying a couple of thousand pods, um, it does add up. So that's something else to consider over there. Uh, next, uh, okay, so that is offline. Uh, that is the offline pause. Okay, one, you set it over there. Two, it then needs to be enabled uh, over here, enable offline. And then finally, three, I think it's over here. Enable offline store that needs to be run. Then it goes and it actually gets everything up and running for it, guys. If you, um, they aren't actually okay, I I don't know of any questions that they put in specifically regarding offline. Um, if there are, once again, just ask me. I will try and help you as best I can. If you do have a situation where you do need to enable this, let me know. And once again, that's what I'm here for is to try and actually help you through this and help you get it set up. Right, step eight, I think, or wherever on. Okay, because the next one is actually quite a fun one, and I'm going to try and uh, show it to you, which is the fail-safe pause, which is the auto-recovery pause. Now, in order for this to work, I need to load up a couple of items, so give me a second. Okay... And yeah, let's put that in as well. There we go. So now we've got a decent amount of things. And what I'm going to do now is something that if I find out that you guys have done this, I'm going to kill you. But um, really, 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 please don't do this. Because oh, one thing you might have noticed is that um, little X button up there is disabled. If you want to shut down the pause, you go here, shut down terminal. Right? That's because the, if, you do, if, you just, if you do what I'm about to do, you will kill your OPOS drivers, and you will cause yourself a world of pain. And I've seen it happen, and it takes hours and hours and hours to diagnose, and find out exactly what's gone wrong with it. But I'm going to do it because this is my because this is my system, and I have to fix these things anyway. So, task manager. As soon as it decides, there we go. And I'm going to just kill the pause this way. For God's sakes, don't do this.
Okay, I'm doing it so I can so I can simulate and show it to you what should uh, what should happen. Now, what essentially uh, happened over here is I was halfway through a transaction, and the power cut. Okay, power cut. A, a thing go, um, the actual uh, the machine goes down. It then the machine goes down. Generator comes back on. Uh, Thirty seconds later, machine uh, comes back up. Person logs back into the system. System, uh, and then they go and they log back into iVend. And if I've got this right, and I click log in, it should take me. It will go and reload at exactly the same point it was before. Yeah. Okay. If you end uh, if you end task and don't restart, then you can end up with problems. So, but yeah. Otherwise, if you restart afterwards, you should be okay. Um, but that's the important thing over here. So you can go see that if even if the power cuts, even and I, because not uh, to be very honest, if you've with a store, you know, not everybody wants to have. Uh, uh, you know, 20, 20 UPCs, uh, uninterrupted power supplies, you know, UPSs, there we go. Um, not everybody wants to have 20 or 30 of those just lying around. Lying around, They go funny, they can cause fires if the batteries are old, um, and particularly if they're used a long time, then the batteries will eventually just, um, the batteries eventually go funny and they don't work anymore. Um, yeah, it's an expense that a lot of places would rather not have to go into. So that's the that is the case over here with this. But um, this over here is now. So, but at least with this over here, if the power cuts, you can log back in. It will be at right right at the same point you were at with the transaction before uh, the power cut. So there we go. All right. Okay, now where are we looking at at the moment? Okay, so uh, now, okay, let's have a look at multiple subsidiaries. Uh, my problem with this is, is that I'm probably actually going to have to go and enable and disable some stuff. So, enterprise, and if I remember correctly, there we go, multiple subsidiaries enabled. Okay, and typically with your multiple subsidiaries, because you can assign different customers to different subsidiaries, um, it does also change the setting of the system. It does also change how it's set up. Typically, with subsidiaries, is we do it only in unplugged mode because if you're plugged, uh, for instance, into SAP B1, which yeah, um, then it does have some. Then a lot of the subsidiary stuff happens on the B1 side, uh, on the ERP side. Um, with the Sage guys, you guys will actually get this functionality because when you go and you get set up, you actually plug into unplugged mode if that makes any sense. Uh, and I'm going to go and assign all customers to subsidiaries. You might not want to do the assign all customers to subsidiaries because obviously um, that might uh, they might not be that way inclined. Um, for instance, I know RTO would say SPA. Um, they don't, uh, they wouldn't do that. But uh, in my case, I'm going to take it. If I go OK. And yes, I love this. Enabling the subsidiary is an irreversible process. Do you want to continue? Uh, in this case, I'm going to go yes because it's my, once again it's my test database, and uh, yeah, I'm probably going to go and zap it anyway. Application will now restart. Uh, I am actually going to go and let's just avoid current transaction. Yes, and it requires management override because of course it does. I just need to shut this down as well. Shut down terminal. Yes, because I don't want anything going wrong. Obviously, uh, obviously, guys, you are meant to. If you're doing multiple subsidiaries, you're meant to enable it when not very many other people are logged into the system, because yeah, it's uh, it's one of those things that if they are, it can cause issues. If you're using a uh, okay over here. If you're using IMED APIs, please uh, be sure to go reset IS. Yes, that's okay. Yes. And here we go. Okay, all right. Oh, giddy doggy, smoggy. Let's go have a look over here. 
Okay, so first off, I'm just going to go check that everything is updated. So there you go, subsidiaries are enabled. Right, so beyond that, um, once you put the subsidiaries in, there are some things that it does go change in the actual setup over here, um, and that's quite specific to it because you do actually need to go and define multiple, so you can actually, uh, uh, well one, obviously you're going to have a default subsidiary, but two, you're going to define multiple subsidiaries. Um, and you can see over here it's got things like what the default is, what the local currency is, because if it's a subsidiary, it may be overseas. So for instance, if I was in South Africa and I then set up a subsidiary in Mozambique, they might, they'll be dealing in, in Metakash as opposed to, uh, opposed to RANDs. Um, but as well, you know, uh, uh, also, it's not just that, it's not just location that defines it that way. I do also know some stores where, um, and in fact, this does. In fact, the place that this sometimes happens is on mines in the in the DRC, um, where it's virtually impossible to get a liquor license. So what they'll do is they'll have a normal mine store, and then the actual shabin or the bar associated with it um, will only take, say, uh, tokens or, um, yeah, it'll be tokens or loyalty points or something like that, where they actually, and what you can do is you can go to the store, and you can buy the tokens, but, and then you can spend the tokens at the Shabin. And that way, when, they, when they're selling alcohol, it's not technically as selling alcohol, it's selling tokens. Just you happen to redeem the tokens for alcohol. So much fun. Fun and games in, uh, fun and games in Africa. Yay. Default, uh, so default, the local currency, your address, so because obviously you will, you might have different addresses. Culture info, uh, once again, what is your culture info that you want to associate there? Because this is the default, it automatically goes with the default one. Um, right there, uh, which time zone, is it tax inclusive or not? Because some places are tax inclusive, some places are tax exclusive. And also it starts to go segment your database as to exactly how these things fit together and assigned to all existing products. So do, does uh, does the subsidiary use all, all existing products, um, which it obviously would because it is the default, assigned to existing customers, assigned to existing vendors, and assigned to existing employees. So you can I you start to get an idea about how exactly you start segmenting the database into its own individual little sections. And with each of those sections, it really starts to go down further and further and further to go and actually make sure that at this particular point, at this particular time, at this particular place, you go and you sell the right thing to the right time at the right person, with the right tax, with the right amount. And I have questions. People are listening. Ooh, I get that warm and fuzzy feeling. Fill them. Okay, all right. Does Ivan support SP branch setup and what would it, would it work the same as subsidiary setup? Uh, yes, we do support the branch setup. Um, with all of its, I do know that branch setup is one of these things that does have some setup issues that are associated with it, but hopefully those have been resolved. Um, but yes, we do. You can go set it up as branches. You do need to be careful about how you do set up those branches, though. Um, I would suggest that if you're going to do it, then rather walk through it with me, um, because I have had one guy who's horribly, horribly, horribly destroyed a system um, because he went and he set up the branches incorrectly. Yeah. So yes, we do support it, and you can use it, and it will go in there. All right. Oh, uh, that actually does remind me of uh, one thing, and just going back to where we started today, which was with the locations. Um, guys, the locations over here. We uh, these are supported even in plugged mode but they are not integrated through to the ERP. Okay, so any of the locations you see here are actually the locations that are, uh, these are these just exist on iVend. There's no corresponding location set in the ERP. If you set things like, uh, for instance, in SAP, if you set bins and locations, we don't bring those across. So, right, uh, we'll, uh, we just assume it's in a warehouse. We don't tell it to move it from bin A to bin B because 
uh, to be very honest, um, where, uh, retail doesn't use bins. Uh, that's a warehousing function. All right, so yeah. Anyway, just thankful I uh, was quickly reminded of that. Uh, one other thing I do just want to quickly go into, uh, I did not mention it earlier when we were doing stores, and that is the e-commerce side, um, because there are actually additional setups for e-commerce. I know we haven't really dived into e-commerce, guys. Um, there are some questions on it, uh, but rather write the exam with me. And if you do get, if you sometimes people just seem to get an e-commerce set of questions. If you do get them, ask me, and I will try and uh, I will try and guide you on them. Um, there is things like the store, uh, the store service API integration, and the uh, user user ID and password. And these will go and link together. Otherwise, the setup is pretty much exactly the same. The only difference is that um, it just links. This is to go link it through to the e-commerce, and then you go initialize e-commerce, and it would go and initialize and set up the e-commerce for you. Okay. All right. So that more or less covers most of what we have to look at today. Okay. I'm not going to look at multiple subsidiaries twice. Um, guys, are there any questions? I mean, just general questions, setup questions, uh, anything else that you that you might be interested in. Uh, uh, questions specific to your ERP. Um, I'll try and answer it as best I can. Um, that's uh, that's also something to consider. Um, search functionality we have covered. Um, I'm just going through and making sure XTEP report is part of the reporting. Done that. Uh, I'm in accessibility. Okay, I have an accessibility, yeah, I have mentioned it, but, um, yeah, I have a slide, yay, PowerPoint, okay, yeah, guys, I think I've mentioned it, now. I think I've talked about I have an accessibility, um, you should know what this is, this is, uh, this is actually what makes I have an, uh, one of the more powerful systems out there, is you are able to go and customize and change things using the accessibility. Um, uh, my uh, Willem, I know you guys have gone and say, uh, you're the guys who went and set up the Vodafone stuff, and you know how powerful this is for uh, going and actually integrating through to things like additional billing systems. And that's something that we can actually have a quick look at over here on, uh, yeah, you see I haven't signed in for this. Um, oh, by the way, has anybody signed in, has everybody signed in for this, uh, uh, for the videos? Have they been able to watch them? Okay, hands up who signed in for the videos. Uh, have you been able to watch them? Okay. Uh, well, uh, in Kirill, I'll, I'll ask you. I'll answer that in a second. Okay, I'm just going to put your hands down. Hands up who's watched any of the videos. Ah, there we go. Okay, right there. So at least a couple of you guys. Okay, that's perfect. All right. Okay. So, um, all right. And yes, and Kira. Okay. To explain, uh, are, uh, as warehouses relates to sites in the ERP, what does subsidiary uh, represent in the ERP? Okay, uh, and Kira, you're talking from the Sage side. All right. In which case, the subsidiary would be a uh, would be a separate. Uh, and uh, and Kira, you'd be talking from the X3 side. Okay, I'm going to try and get this right, but uh, once again, I do take this under, uh, uh, I do stand under correction for this. Um, this would be the, uh, that would be under the folder. Okay, so the folder would be your primary point. Your company would fall under there. Your individual subsidiaries would fall into different companies in the folder. All right, or at least that's my understanding. That, that's sort of what I understood from Willem last time I went and I chatted to him. But that's... Uh, um, that also is under advisement. I do know that he is look that there are one or two other ways you can handle it in X3. Um, we I don't think we've really had the situation where we've needed it yet, but it can be done. I do know that that is very specifically one of the reasons we did do that. Yeah. And speaking of which, I have remembered there is something that we can go through just quickly, and that will uh, that we do need to, that we should cover. Um, this is only un in Ivan Unplugged, unfortunately, because most of you other guys do have your own e uh, MRP systems. But Ivan does actually have its 
if I go over here, it's own forecasting system. And I can go over here, I can go set my forecast planning. All right, where I can go say which historical sales year, which forecasting year. Um, once again, if uh, once again, guys, uh, sales to uh, 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 retail talk versus ERP to versus ERP talk. Um, yes, this is technically forecasting. It's not MRP. Right. So just be aware of that when you're actually selling this to people. Um, which uh, uh, what what are I basing it on? Product, product category, product group, or the merchandise hierarchy. Guys, please remember what the merchandise hierarchy is. Uh, who here does not know what the merchandise hierarchy is? Just put up your hand. Okay. All right, guys. Merchandise hierarchy. Uh, it's over here. All right. Um, this is not, once again, um, uh, for, for you SAP guys, this is not the 64 properties. All right, this is a separate hierarchy that you can actually put into the system where you've got multiple uh, multiple levels, multiple grouping levels you can put in, and you can actually set this up uh, for multiple, you can set up multiple hierarchies for one item. So, I can, uh, and uh, yes guys, um, and I think the I also covered this last week, but yes, guys, when I actually did this, um, you do need to go and have. Okay, ah, oh, that is a very good question, Philem. I will go and get to it as soon as I've just finished on the merchandise hierarchy. Um. Okay, so the merchandise hierarchy is over here. Uh, these are set. Uh, uh, these are set. These are then assigned to your different. Uh, to your different items. Okay, let's just do a quick search. And you can then go and assign multiple hierarchies. You see I've got one hierarchy here already. I can then go and assign an additional hierarchies uh, with exactly where my, um, exactly who fits in what where. So I can essentially set up a matrix of groups that go for my uh, for my merchandise hierarchy here. And uh, in case you are wondering, uh, yes, SAP guys, I have had to do this before for SAP, um, and I ended up doing it in Boyum. And uh, that took about a month to do. So, well, not quite that long. It took about two weeks to do, and about another two weeks to test. So, yeah, it did take time. Um, but that is also quite important for your merchandise hierarchies. Uh, okay, just before I get back to forecast planning, uh, over here I did get the question: uh, Can you uh, can you switch from unplugged to plugged and vice versa? Uh, okay, guys, if you are in plugged mode, um, and if I'm say plugged to business one, I'm that's the way I, I'm set up. Um, I can't just switch it to unplugged and carry on. Uh, the reason for this is that when I plug into Business One or when I plug into Nav or when I plug into uh, Sage, well, Sage is a special case though, um, when I plug into Business One or, or Nav or SAP ECC6, there are certain functions I turn on and off in the system and certain setups that I do in the system in a certain way. So if I was to say move from business one to nav or from nav to business one, I would then need to go, uh, I would actually need to re-implement iVent. Um, and that's actually, it's kind of recommended because the problem is, is that if you go and is that as, uh, as time goes by on a system, people generally find that they go and they accrue a lot of settings that they don't understand, they didn't know how it works. That's sometimes why some places just benefit from having a re-implementation after three or four years. All of a sudden it's a new database, they've thrown out all the stuff that they don't need, and it, it's in, it runs, and it works, and they know what they want, they use it, they go forward. Um, that is something else to go and to go and consider here. Um, for you Sage boys, because you are integrated with our unplugged version, you actually get a special deal, is that you can actually move, you can actually just go and plug it in, um, having said that, once again, that does mean that you do get issues, that you can end up getting issues um, because of the legacy data. Um, technically, the way the Sage integration is written, 
it's quite literally a case of uh, it's a drop down box. You can go, okay, I'm on stage one. Oh no, now I want to move to stage 300, and it's just a drop down box, and it shifts over to stage 300, and then it's a set, then it's another drop down box, and then it just shifts over to X3. I wouldn't recommend doing that at the moment because I do know that moving from one to the other, it's not a, it's not so much an Ivan problem, so much as when you do it, it's going to affect the way that you implement uh, X3 or 300 or Sage 1. Well, not so much Sage 1, but 300 and X3 definitely. So yeah, um, that's the that's the short, uh, that's the long answer to that. Having said that, uh, please remember that. Um, if you are doing a re-implementation, you should actually be going and taking note of what does work in the present system. Uh, to be very honest, guys, like I, uh, I think I've told you before, um, to go set up a new IVIN system, a brand new IVIN system from scratch, will take you uh, will take you half an hour, really, and that's including installation time. So, all right, back to forecasting. So over here I can set my historical sales, forecast year, when's it based on, from which product to which product, consider re refunds in the forecast, uh, which warehouses I'm associating with, uh, with the forecast here. Once I've done that, I can then go across to my, uh, where's it, business transactions, to my actual forecast here, and I can go select my forecast planning method here. And then I will be able to go see my different forecasts for historical sales and forecast. There's my historical sales. There's my forecasted data. Yes, and then I can start to go drill down into my different types of item. Um, there are various forecasting methods. There's exp uh, there's uh, I'm I'm not going to guys. There's I don't think there's questions out there that goes and says is Box Jenkins a valid forecasting method in Ivin? Um, yeah, it, it, I, I'll tell you what. If you get that one wrong, I'll give you the point. So, right. Well, if you get that question and you get it wrong, I'll give you the point. I don't think there's a question like that. Um, but there are a batch of these things over here. If you really want to, go wiki up on them. Um, I'm not going to go through each individual one. There are methods. There are uh, intermittent data. There's one of these ones actually got, there you go. So curve fitting, you know, how does it exactly go fit through on the curve fitting stuff? Um, yeah, you know, these things over here, there is a lot of, uh, once again, forecasting. Guys, to be very honest, any forecasting I've found, uh, even when you're dealing with an MRP, even when you're dealing with a sophisticated MRP, um, doesn't go and uh, I've found doesn't actually really uh, cater for, uh, well, it's more of an art than a science. Um, and I will argue with anybody who argues, who goes and says that it's a science because uh, I will tell you right now, uh, well, I'll give you some examples of when forecasters got it wrong. Um, and uh, first one is, uh, well, 9-11. You know, nobody saw, nobody saw that one coming. Uh, Brexit, uh, Trump getting elected president. Uh, I mean, I, I, I actually, I actually remember the day before Trump getting elected. I, I went and I saw on CNN that they were saying that it was uh, the pollsters were saying it's. I think it was a uh, hundred to one that Trump gets elected, and that was on the day before the election. So, um, yeah, you know, that's also uh, that's that's also uh, things that they were saying, and that's when they got it wrong, and you know. That's where, and those, those kind of things will have impacts on uh, on your forecasting, on what you should be buying and selling, and all the rest, and uh, what is actually displayed over here. So, um, yeah, that's uh, that's my that's my suggestion on this is that it is here. You can use this. You can export this um, to uh, to an XLS. You can edit it, and you can import it back in again for your forecasting. Once you've done that, you can then generate your forecast. And from your generated forecast, you can then go to your replenishment. On your replenishment, you open this up, and using selecting your forecast over here, uh, considering your different locations, how they all fit together, you can then go select all and run. End date. Okay, right there. Obviously, it wants me to go change the date. So there we go. Run, and there it will go. Tell me. 
give me recommendations what to buy. Um, depending on what the order date is on the product, um, which warehouse it recommends it for, I can then select which UOM I want. I can actually change the order quantity. So if I want to order 6,000 instead of that, this all depends on the information that is loaded into your items, so your minimum and maximum quantities, your uh, whether you do local purchases or whether you do uh, transfers, uh, who your supplier is, um, all the rest of these things can be modified and then you can actually go and uh, save it and post it and those will go post these in. Next one up. Is forecasting done in SAP B1 pulled through to iVend? Um, very good question. Uh, what would happen is your forecasting done in B1 would be loaded into B1 and then finally the and then the effects of the forecasting would be loaded would be pulled through into iVend. So your purchase orders and your stock transfers that come through would actually come through would your purchase order and stock transfers that are posted in B1 would then come through into iVend. Okay, but the actual forecasting and the recommendation report um, is actually that's that's all done in B1. And to be very honest, that's more where it should be done. Um, ERPs tend to go and have more advanced, more sophisticated forecasting tools. Um, look, this is this does very well. Um, one of the reasons that we integrate an unplugged version into uh, we integrate as unplugged into 300. Uh, Sage 300 is because of that forecasting there. It's so you guys can use it, um, because I do know that I do know Sage has got a forecasting module, but I do think it's a bit expensive. Whereas compared to this one, it's not. Um, by the way, guys, the forecasting module is a licensed component, so there is a license fee that does go with it. Um, but that is something else that you just need to be aware of. Um, okay. All right. Oh, one other thing with locations is that we've got the location transfer. Um, this is to transfer between, say, your default location. In, uh, this is basically an in an inside warehouse transfer. It's not between warehouses. Let me go back to my favorite slide, and I will show you. I will enlighten you as to how it goes on. It's not between store one and store two. That's not a location transfer. A location transfer is within store one itself. So it's like from it's like from the general receiving area to the uh, to the fruit and veg section. Okay, it's not a um, it's all going and moving it from the uh, the replacement section to the. Uh, moving it from the replacement section to the uh, general area to be sent back. That over there is what I'm talking about with the location transfer. I am not talking about from one area. I'm not talking about between warehouses here. Okay. Please remember there is an import file that is associated with it. Uh, and I think this is actually a TXT import file. So, right, that's there. 